The first letter in Revelation chapter 2 is to the church at Ephesus. Jesus is speaking to them. And the church at Ephesus was a very important church. It was a mother church to many others. In fact, Paul had spent three years there. If you look back in the book of Acts, this was one of the churches that he helped establish. Ephesus as a town was an important town, an important city. There were about 250,000 people who lived there. It was a capital city. It was well known throughout the Roman Empire. They had great architecture. They built an amazing stadium, a marketplace. In fact, they had constructed a theater on the slope of a mountain that overlooked the harbor and seated about 25,000 people. If you lived in Ephesus, you had a lot of entertainment, a lot to do, a lot of ways to make money. The, the town also boasted of its worship to the goddess, the false goddess Artemis, or as the Romans called her, Diana. And this idolatry was just rampant throughout the city of Ephesus. And the, the industry of making these images to the worship for the worship of Artemis was one of the major industries. So there was a lot going on in Ephesus that was working against the church and against the Christians for sure. And into the midst of this, Jesus speaks and he reveals himself to the Ephesians as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now remember those seven stars are the seven angels representing those ministering spirits to the churches. And they're held in the right hand of Jesus representing his power. And it says that he walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is how Jesus reveals himself to Ephesus. Ephesus, I walk among the seven golden lampstands, the churches. I am present in the mix of this, this scenario with you. I am present in your city. As godless as it is, I am here with you. That should have given them courage and hope. Now, Christ commended them in this letter for at least five things. He says, look, you guys are hard workers. You are persevering. You don't tolerate wicked or false teachers like those Nicolaitans, and you are enduring, you have not grown weary. And so he commended them for good works, for the things that they were doing right. But what happened? He speaks into the midst of this, and he, he warns them, and he tells them something they're doing wrong. He says, you have forsaken your first love. They were no longer practicing their first love as they had in the beginning. And for that reason, Christ gave them this morning, repent and do the things you did at first. If not, Christ will remove your lampstand. He will remove your church if you do not do the things you did in the beginning. Can you think back to when you first knew Christ as your Savior? What did you do in the beginning? How did you draw close to him? How did you feel toward him? How did you love your neighbor? How did you feel toward others? Christ wants us to return to our first love. And that was his message to the Ephesians in, in, the, in the church at Ephesus. And at the very end of this letter to Ephesus, something precious happens. Jesus says that he reminds them that he has given them to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God, representing the abundant eternal life that they have received through Jesus Christ. Now, interesting thing here. In this great temple of Artemis, the false goddess, they had created these beautiful gardens, and there was in the center a tree, a tree that was very important to their culture and to their false religion. And in fact, it was sometimes symbolized on their coins that were minted and, and printed there for, for use in commerce. And at this tree, there was um, this focal point. It had become a focal point for asylum. Any criminal who could get to that tree would be free from capture and punishment. And so Jesus, in the midst of this culture, he's speaking to them about another tree, the absolute perfect tree, the only tree that can give you life and freedom from sin and and captivity to sin. And so he's using something in this culture, in this place, at this time to say, look, what what Rome and what um, the, the, the commerce of Ephesus and the false goddess of Ephesus offers you is nothing compared to the tree of life in the paradise of God, where you will find 
real freedom from your sin. So return to your first love. The letter to Smyrna is a little shorter. Jesus finds no fault with the church in Smyrna. The point of his message to them seems to be to encourage them in the midst of a very difficult persecution. In fact, they may have even been persecuted to the point of death for their faith in the Lord Jesus. So Jesus reveals himself to them right away as the first and the last. The one who died and came to life again. The resurrected Lord is speaking to them. And he is calling them to victory through their perseverance in the midst of persecution. In fact, he says their victory will be solid, complete, unmistakable, undeniable. They will not be hurt at all by the second death. The second death being spiritual death, eternal separation from God. That will not touch them as God's children. Those who are faithful to the end, Christ will give them this victor's crown, the crown of life. The source of the persecution in Smyrna was from a certain synagogue where they claimed to be the people of God. But Jesus called them out. He called them the synagogue of Satan. These were the persecutors of the true believers. Interestingly enough, Smyrna was known as the city with a crown because it had this beautiful architecture and it was nestled against a hill and the, the steep hill was like the crown of the city, but it offered nothing in comparison with the victor's crown of life that Jesus was offering the believers of Smyrna, the promise of eternal life for those who faithfully follow him. The third church that Jesus speaks to in Revelation chapter 2 is the church at Pergamum. And Jesus reveals himself to them as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, the invincible one, the one with the word of truth. And he says to them, I know where you live. And it's a hard place. Jesus says it's where Satan has his throne. And yet they've done some things well. Jesus says that they've clung to Jesus' name and they've not denied the faith. In fact, one of them, Antipas, has given his own life as a faithful witness. And yet others have not done so well. Jesus points out the things that have gone badly. Some of the people have held to the teaching of Balaam. In other words, they've eaten food dedicated to idols and they've indulged in sexual immorality. They've held to false teachings, the teachings of the Nicolaitans, and they had mingled in with the culture. It's like they couldn't say no to the culture around them. In this place of Pergamum, in this city, there was a famous shrine to a false god, a god of healing, supposedly, named Asclepius. The symbol for Asclepius was a serpent, Again, the place where Satan lives. This was a major center for the imperial cult of Rome as well, where the Roman governor was worshipped for that whole region. Interestingly, the buildings there in Pergamum were made from a black stone, and they had inscriptions carved in them from white marble. And guests at feast were given white stones from that region with their names just to indicate how important they were, that they had been welcomed and received and they had been invited guests, maybe like a place card that we would put at a table today to honor our guests. But again, Jesus warns them. He says, Satan has his throne among you. Repent. If you don't, I'll come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And he gives a promise as well. He says, if you conquer, to the one who conquers, Christ will give secret manna. In other words, the place that you're living may be starving you spiritually and emotionally and physically, but Christ will give you secret manna that fills the hunger of your soul. And not only that, he says, I'll give you a white stone. It'll have a new name written on it. 
a stone oh, just for you with that name that nobody knows except the one who receives it. This was an expression of Christ's love and intimacy and invitation, just like those guests that would receive a white stone with their name on it in that town when they attended a feast. Jesus says, I have a better thing for you. I have a greater name for you. I have a better white stone for you that signifies my love and my care for you and that intimacy that I want us to share together. The last church that Jesus speaks to in Revelation chapter 2 is the church at Thyatira. And he reveals himself to this church as the one whose eyes are like flaming fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze or exquisite brass. Now that would have grabbed their attention because in their area, they were known for great, beautiful copper and bronze work. It was something that they were accustomed to, but Jesus was revealing himself to them as someone whose feet were of exquisite brass. In other words, better, more beautiful than they had ever seen before. He also reveals himself in this passage as the one who searches minds and hearts. So he sees through our very soul. He sees what's in our thoughts. He sees what's in our hearts. Now he commends them. He congratulates them on doing some things very, very well. He says, you're loving, you're faithful, you are patient, you serve. In fact, the, the works you're doing now are more than you've done ever before for the Lord. So he's commending them for things that they've done well. But he's also warning them about things that they have not done well. In fact, some things have gone very wrong. They have tolerated Jezebel, who deceives and promotes fornication and idol worship. In other words, they had allowed the culture of the area, the immorality to seep into their lives, and the idol worship had affected them. They were being led into what Jesus describes as satanic depths. The church had compromised with the pagan society around them, and Jesus warns them that anyone who's participated in that spirit of Jezebel will be judged unless they repent. Jesus is calling the church to repentance for the wicked things that they've done. And remember, he penetrates to the heart and soul. So he sees our thoughts, not just our actions. He tells everyone else to hold tight to what you've been doing, to the good works, to the way that you're serving the Lord. Don't give in, hold on. Because the one who conquers is the one that Christ will give authority to. In fact, there's this great promise here of how Christ is going to involve us in his kingdom work. Once again, when he returns, it says he will give us, us authority over the nations. And it says something precious here. It says, you'll receive the morning star. Well, Jesus is himself the morning star. If you look forward to Revelation 22, 16, that's where it calls Jesus the morning star. What better gift to be promised than Jesus himself? Jesus intends to make us a royal priesthood. He is forming us into his kingdom people. So he says, don't give up. Hold on to what you're doing. Continue to serve me. And he is there in the midst of it with us. And he says at the very end, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches.